<laughs> it's a pleasure to introduce Captain Ronald Young from the Amherst Police Department. He's been employed here since 1987 when he was first assigned as a community service officer. He served in various roles, primarily in the Detective Bureau. He is a graduate of the Southern Police Institute Command Officers Training Corps and has a master's degree in criminal justice from Westfield State University. Today's presentation will focus on the transformation of the Amherst Police Department from a single night watchman yeah. <laughs> to a much larger modern agency. The culture of the Amherst Police is based on a tradition that has modest beginnings but is fundamental to its identity and place within the Amherst community. So truly this is, uh, this is my pleasure for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I've had a couple of conversations out in, the, out in the hallway, and my reason for being here is kind of born from a complete accident. One of the, the chief had charged me to kind of get rid of some of the junk that we have in our basement. Um, and so when I was in the basement looking for junk, I started uncovering all these different things. Most notably, they were photographs. And, but then when I started finding like these old, these old uniforms and um, some of these old tunics and things, and, and even in my very limited intellect, I thought to myself, you know, these belong to somebody other than us. And so that's why I reached out to George and that kind of is like what started the ball rolling for, for why we're here. So the first thing I need to do is say that I, I am certainly have not become an expert on the Amherst Police Department history. I have, I'm in a much better place than I was a year ago just because it is so fascinating. But we thought this would be a great starting place to maybe start and talk about some of the things that we've learned. I've already learned some things from some new friends today about um, you know things that happened before my research. So. So that being said, um, this is kind of the, the first like 33 minutes or 33 minutes and 30 seconds, this is going to be an unabashed and unashamed like appeal that tell us about where we are today. Um, it made kind of sense to talk about like what we do now at the police department before we talked about the past. And when I was trying to figure out or make a kind of an idea of what I wanted to chat about, how I did it was um, just talk about kind of very briefly some of the things that we're doing in the community today. And then I will go back to like, the chiefs of police and like what happened underneath each one of their their room. It's very odd, and we, we've got a police department that's been in existence since about about 1876 or so, um, and we've only ever had six chiefs. So, which is really kind of odd. Yeah, in a hundred years. Yeah, it's very anomalous. You know, of course, Chief Chief Maya and Chief Hart took up about half that century. So, um, so the the rest of it's kind of child's play, but. Um, I think if, and I'll pick on Chief Mike because he's not here, I think it's longer than that, but um, it, it's, it's really interesting, you know, whereas in today's day and age, and if you knew kind of like the inside and the fundamentals of what's going on in policing today with, with, with just some of the turmoil in our community and some of the problems that are happening with some, you, it, it is rare for a police chief to last longer, politically, longer than three or four years wow. um, in most police departments that are of any su substantial size. And, I'll, and again, this is an unashamed and unabashed thing, and I don't, and I don't apologize for this. It's like, it's like the Reese's commercial, not sorry, <laughs> not sorry. Um, it's hard to be a police officer in Amherst. The, the community expects a lot from us, and the byproduct of that is, is it, it kind of makes us better. We make mistakes, we make a lot of mistakes, but, um, and I'm kind of proud of it. So if that comes through, Phyllis, oh. check, <laughs> read me on the please. Thank you. Um, so, we have a mission statement. I won't bore you with it. Um, one of the things that I do is one of the things that, that came about and when we talk, I'm going to talk briefly, very briefly about each chief. Um, one of the things that Chief Maya did do was is he started to instill the idea of like where we were going to be 10 and 15 years now. The, this concept of strategic management and the concept of thinking strategically what was going to happen when he wasn't the chief anymore. Um, fundamentally, that is really a backbone of what we do as an agency. I recognize that in a few short years, I'm going to be living somewhere in Florida driving my wife nuts. It's going to happen. We all know it. You might as well say it. Um, but there is going to be, there are so many people behind me that are so much more well-read and, and more prepared for the future. And our mission statement kind of, we try to change it on a, on a biannual basis just to reflect where we're going. Sometimes it's changed very in, in minute manner, in ways, but we understand that that's the future. And again, I don't want to bore you guys with things like that. A couple of things that we're going to talk about. One of the things that Chief Sherpa did. We're going to talk about his state. Um, was he was a, he, he forced us to be an accredited agency, wow. and I was one. I was a sergeant at the time, 
and I kicked and screamed all the way through it, and I, I think I pounded my fist on the ground. It has made us a better agency. Um, it, is, it is a standard that we, matter of fact, our reassessment was just a couple weeks ago, and um, we still get better, and we still we find best practices, and we identify things that we do wrong, and the way, like we found some documentation things a couple weeks ago that were just inept. They were old school, so you know we improved it, and that's 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 what it brings to the table. Um, I won't bore you with organizational charts. I put this up here just to kind of show you when we started at the beginning, kind of like where we are, and we have all these organizational charts, and we use fancy words like units and <laughs> missions, and you know at some point it all started with some poor guy who's walking around downtown checking the gas lamps. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so, but we do maintain organizational charts. Um, our staff is big. We, we, we always average, we're, we're approved for about 50 officers. Um, that's, that's what we're approved for financially. We, we use them in a bunch of different ways. Um, obviously, we have patrol officers, which most people know. They you call 911, you get a cop. Um, we have investigative units. Um, we have canine officers. We spend a lot of time working on community outreach and things of that nature. It depends on which one you're talking about. That's TJ and Dash. So TJ is a really nice guy. Dash frightens me. Oh yeah. A lot frightens me. All right, quick war story. I grew up in Springfield, right? So in, I grew up in uh, in um, the Forest Park section of Springfield. You guys know it. So, well, my nana, my, my grandmother, she came from she was an immigrant from Ireland. Um, she would, you know, being a fat kid, I, I could ride my bike down there after school and she'd feed me. And then I could go back to my house and I'd get fed again. It's <laughs> the so way you think when you're a fat kid, right? So I got on my Schwinn with a banana seat and sissy bar and I was riding and I was riding down Dorset Street in Springfield and a, and a German shepherd ran off her front porch and it bit me. <gasps> Completely unprovoked, by the way. <laughs> and, and, and now I was probably nine or ten years old and I'm 53 now and I still. I'm still terrified of the shepherds. Yeah. Um, so th that's what my record says, you know. The other dog, Marvin, he's a mellow, and he's smaller, and he's sweet. <laughs> so when I leave the gym tonight, I'll go out the front door and all the way around to go to my car, because if you walk by, Dash waits till I'm nearby, and then he attacks me through the glass. <laughs> and someday he's going to defeat the glass. We all know it. We all know it. So, um, Anyways, I'm sorry to digress, and, I, and I'll continue to do that. Um, so we spend a lot of money on copying now, um, about $5 million, you know, a lot of, between, between what we're budgeted for police officers, outreach, uh, everything from, from, from things that we do for, uh, for training, we, we spend a lot of money on training, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we respond to respond to calls at patrol division. That's the backbone of most policing agencies. It's, it's still what it, it was. What it was when we talk here in a little bit. What it was back in the teens and the twenties, um, and it's what it is today. And you know, people call nine one one. They expect a competent person to come and give them a hand. So that's that's what we do. But we also have a bunch of other things that we do. Um, if you just it breaks down our calls for service, we want to bore you. We answer about twenty thousand calls of service a year. Um, which is, you know, you know, for a 50, 50 person police department, it's actually, it's actually, you know, it's a busy police department. But again, we all know that because we're from the community. It's a busy town. It's, you know, it's. I wish the front, I guess I get my glasses on. Right, what's the top one? Oh, I intentionally left them blurry, Phyllis, because I want to try and hide no, the facts. What's, These are, the, what's the most cold? Is it accidents or is it? Um, I think I think that the probably the most the most fun, the most common call is for a, a general disturbance. Oh, okay. And it, it's a kind of a records keeping glitch. So oh, okay. so if somebody calls in and says, you know, I heard a lot a loud bang in my neighborhood. I know oh, it is. Right, it, okay. it kind of gets it's like a catch all. Oh, okay. Like okay. And the smallest one is homicide. Thank God. You know, I've been around here for thirty. And I think I've been to four murders, and that's yeah, that's enough for me. Only two robbers. Robberies are a funny thing. So robberies are, because of the old UCR statistics, which for those of us to bore everyone to death, we were required to report certain things to the federal government. You know, the Part A and the Part B, or back in the day, like most days you call them Title I and Title II crimes. Mm -hmm. they, they, they've broken robbery down to a variety of different things now. So now that we report things as a, as a NIBRS complaint, which goes through the state police and ultimately to the FBI, 
things that would have been classified as robberies in the past are not anymore. Oh, shoplifting. So, shoplifting um, somebody grabs a you know a purse from somebody like a purse snatching. It's not considered a robbery anymore, oh, even though to me it's a robbery. So um, it's, it's that's a whole other ball of wax. We of course have a detective bureau. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about, ironically, at the bottom here is, is records keeping. And my new friends that we were talking about in the in, in the hallway were saying that prior to prior, prior to the '60s, we were really poor at keeping records. The police department was really terrible at record keeping. Um, we did it. It was sporadic, and it wasn't it wasn't codified as to, in terms of what we we're going to do. So, and then a bunch of other things we do. We you know we have we neighborhood liaison. We try to we try to spend a lot of time with people in town who. Don't like the cops. That's one of the things that we found actually helps. Um, we also try to do things that are not traditional policing. You know, I, I think the worst thing that ever happened to the to law enforcement in the, in the country is the radar gun. You know, uh, because mm -hmm. most of the people there, you know, the first contact other than me that my daughter ever had with a police officer was when my wife got stopped for speeding. So <laughs> it's like you know, it, you know, we try to do things that aren't traditional enforcement. It it, um, it helps us. And it's for selfish reasons. I'd like to say it's for it's for selfish reasons. You know, we try to make friends with people who, quite frankly, just don't trust the cops. So that's, that's one of the things we do. Um, and, and one of those things is this. This is my brainchild. I'd like to say that. Well, I stole it. I, I, I stole this from somebody. But we do that. Um, we can keep going. So we also recognize that we have some issues here in town with with drug abuse. So we all are keenly aware of what's going on with the opioid opioid crisis in, in the country. So. We've, we've, uh, we're starting to deal with that now. Um, we've trained people, officers especially, that have a background in clinical support. Uh, all the three of these officers have a background in it, so, and that's what they do. We, we, we talk about uh, dealing with people in a non-custodial way, um, aftercare, um, resource, resource development, and things like that. Basically what we do with people who have overdosed is we meet with them again in a non you know, a non-threatening way and just try to offer them resources. And we found that a lot of people do take advantage of aftercare um, and it's become very important in our community. We haven't had an OD death in two years. And that's not accidental. Well, 18 months. 18 months is probably a fair one. Last, um, we, we uh, through Craig's door, we have some li liaison officers, again, that have, have a clinical background. Mike Barone on the right there, um, who's short, but I won't say that because he, I'll say that because he's not here. Um, you know, Mike Barone has a background. He worked for, for many years down at uh, BHN, uh, the Health Network in Springfield. He, and so he, he works with a lot of our friends here uh, in, in, in our community that either have mental health issues or homeless or both, um, and substance abuse issues as well. So that's something we do. Again, I'm trying not to bore folks here. We do spend a lot of time training, and, and when I get into the second half of this, we're going to talk about this. One of the things that Chief Maya did when he became the chief was back in back in the early 70s, he recognized some of the deficiencies and the problems that were going on in the country as it relates to policing. The problems that we still see to this day, you know, th things that things that happen, police overreach, things like that, that are simply can be trained away. So, and we'll talk about that. Um, we talk about safety in schools. You guys don't care about that, but I don't want to put you up about that. We, we, do, we do train people throughout the community. We have, we, we have a lot of folks at Workforce that are prior military, um, and they have some skill sets. And so as a result of that, they have put together these programs where they meet with not just the school department, but town buildings. And now we're working with different, different retailers and people in the community that are just having a plan that if there's an act of violence in the community, what would be a good idea and what would be an appropriate response and how to handle that. So that's, that's an important part of it. And you don't care about dispatch. Um, <laughs> It's interesting though. Well, we do. Oh, yeah. Sorry, oh no, please I, I don't tell Mike Curtin because he's the the supervisor, a friend of mine. I just didn't think that would be funny. Actually, dispatch is a really interesting part of what we're going to talk about a little later on. The communications were really sporadic with policing early, early on, and, and what the call boxes did, and then you know when we actually, I mean, we didn't have 911 in, in the police station until 1970, so um, it's kind of interesting. So. And again, types of calls, we already talked about that. So that's We also, we oversee animal welfare um, here in the community. Many people know Carol. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, she has a barred owl there. Another thing that I'm scared of. <laughs> yeah, that's an awesome photograph. <laughs> when I was a sergeant, so I'm in, this, I'm, in the, I'm in the little vestibule, right? I'm a sergeant, it's like three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, a, and I just want to go home. I get off at three. And 
this woman walks in the lobby. It's hot. It was in the summertime, like July or August, and she, a woman, and a woman I see around town. From I was about my age. She goes, "Hey, I was just on Southeast Street. I was headed home. I worked. She worked at the university, and I hit an owl. I'm like, oh, really? And she goes, and here it is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, oh my heavens. And it was just for the record, angry. Didn't like it. So being a city kid, I'm like, put that thing down, put it down. So she does. Now I have an owl hopping around the lobby. They didn't. And just for the record, they don't cover that in the academy. That's not, they, they don't cover that anywhere in the academy. Um, oh, if, anybody, if anybody knows Buzz Foster, just passed away a couple weeks ago. Yes. Did anyone know Buzz? Yeah, uh, Fozzie's father. So yeah. his wife was 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 uh, was involved with it at the time, Birds of Prey, and she actually came down like three in the morning with a big box and put this owl in and brought it somewhere. So I watched one of my friends drive away with this creature in the front seat, and I'm like, oh, time for me to go home too. So, so, so that's what that's that. So, anyways. So that's that's kind of where we are today in a ten ten minute thing. Um, I, I again, I, I'm not sorry, um, but I wanted you to know where we've come. Um, we're all, we're always improving, and that's kind of where we're at. So here's a little bit of the history, and this is not a complete thing. It's just kind of a start. As I said, I I broke it down. I made a couple of notes here, so I don't skip them. Um, I broke it down kind of by the chiefs, and that seemed to make a lot of sense because of the way it happened. Um, and the way time went by. So if we could look here super briefly, this is the this is the way the police station looked when I came to work in the 80s, yes. in the early 80s. Remember? Yeah, yeah. It was in the basement. It yeah. was down in the basement. Yeah. He made the entrance down here. Yeah, right. He yeah. walked downstairs. Yeah. Chief Maya's office was up on the second yeah. deck, yeah. Up by the where the town clerk's office is now. Yeah. Um, and we parked in this spot out here was always reserved for the shift commander. So the sergeant got this spot, and if you were a lonely peon like me, you had to park around the back of the building. Um, we had a lockup here. Um, there was a three-cell lockup that was downstairs in the basement, and there was a detective bureau, which was a little room ahead. There were two detectives when I came on board, and um, and the rest of us we shared that common area. There was a booking room, a little squad room, um, and if we needed training, we trained up in the in the community room, the town community room. That's where we did our training. So if we didn't go to the academy and that was it and i was so proud you know walk in there we had we had five police cars and we shared them one of them burned oil really badly the old unit c so <laughs> you tried to get to work early so you didn't get that um these are the when you're 23 year old boy this is what you think about okay, right? so so that's it that's kind of where i started and it's hard to believe that that was some 30 no, going on 33 years ago um of course things have changed dramatically so the first night watchman was just there he came on board in the 1870s. Is he related to Don? I think that he is. Wow. So Don, if, if folks don't <laughs> know he Don, looks like him. He looks like Don. Well, that is Don. <laughs> 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 I was say, that's not a Don. Like, <laughs> that is Don. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know Don, he's, <laughs> when I came on board, Don was my sergeant, um, ah. and he lives on Sandwich Street. I'm still. He's, he just lost his wife and just passed away this yeah, past yeah. this past year. So. Um, Don, uh, Don is very special to me. So, but I think that I, uh, I think that somewhere down the line the lineage is there. I try to convince Don to look it up in greater detail, but um, if you knew, no doubt at all, he's kind of a grumpy old guy, yeah. um, and he's not much in the mood to do it these days. Someday I'm going to do it on my own. But I, I believe Don Fisk there lived, Fisk there lived on Strong Street, um, and how he got the. Uh, the job is a different story, but there were some political connections. And of course, Don Don lives on Salem Street, but he didn't grow up there. He grew up he grew up on North Whitney Street, on Upper Ward North Whitney Street. So, um, so anyways, that's that's kind of interesting. And what why I think that's really interesting for me, and this I kind of put two of them together. Don Don retired in 1987 when I was a young cop, and he gave to me a, a box key, right? So. There's this call box key, this brass key. So, oh. And he got this from Bud Heath, oh. and Bud Heath got it from somebody else. This key's probably 100 years old, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And back when I first came on the job, everything that was, we popped everything open with the box. The only thing that this opens, there's two places this opens left in town. The, the uh, lights here at University Drive in, in Amity, and the lights in the center of North Amherst. Uh. You can pop it open, you can run the lights. But when I first got on the job, this opened everything. This was the key to the city, so to speak. Wow. And I've been carrying it around all these years. It's basically useless. I've been a policeman for about 20 years. Oh, but it's cool. 
and, and that when I was putting this together, I realized just kind of how special that is. Yeah. That's kind of cool. I, the Chief has one, and uh, if anyone knows John Chudzik, he's badge one. He and I came on together the same. He has one. The, the rest of them, if they're still in the building, I don't know where the heck they are. So at some point, I'll, this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the station. And one for, the, for, for a couple more years, I'm going to hang on. It's good luck. It's good luck. Yeah. So, so, that, so that's, I just think it's kind of interesting. Don, I worked for Don, and I believe that the first person that, that populated the police department saw Mr. Thayer, the original, the elder, if you will, he wasn't actually hired as a policeman, he was hired as a lamplighter. And we were chatting out in the hallway that I guess that was that was was not unusual for, for many agencies. I think the first night watchmen were also the people that were lamplighters. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that's kind of fascinating. He actually he actually Fisk there at the time was not an Amherst resident. He lived in Leverett. He was an Amherst mm -hmm. kid originally, but he lived in Leverett at the time. And he came all the way down in the wow. evenings to take care of this kind of mm -hmm. Kind of really fascinating. So was his routine to patrol, so to speak, because he was going from lamp to lamp? So he would go, he, this, what we now think of as the center business district, yeah. he would go from lamp to lamp and then eventually, and it, again, records being poor, but there is an indication that he started to be a night watchman. He would rattle some of the doors of the downtown businesses okay. Okay. and then replace them. So again, to kind of make it bring it in today, I get, when I first got hired, I, did anyone remember the old community service officer oh, sure. from, from the 70s and the 80s when I was a community service yeah. officer? And that was my job was I came almost to rattle the doors. And I, yeah. I would go down and I knew every door in the center of this town. Yeah. They're all so different now. Yeah. Call opticians that isn't there any longer oh, and yeah. the class A cafe. Right. Yeah. Uh, but we would rattle the doors and the lineage kind of goes back to that. And if you, if, 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 if the chief came in the morning and saw on the log that there was something, I'm talking chief mine now, and you didn't find it when you're out, said, you paid for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it was not under, and again, the lineage kind of goes back to what this Did was. the early lamplighters have to put them out in the morning after they'd lit them in the evening? Or I don't know the answer to that. The lights went yeah. out either at 11 or pardon, midnight. Oh, so we would have turned them off at midnight. He, he, was, he was the tender, right? Even that was part of his job was to, was to put them off. Okay. Huh. Now, the, the, the records that I see, he was unarmed. He was unarmed other than maybe carrying a billy club or something and a flashlight. After the turn of the century, because of course flashlights early on and like they didn't exist, right? So, um, so imagine that. That must have been kind of a lonely existence. I think of that all the time. But anyways. Um, so, after that, you know, once we got in, once we got into the late 1800s, they actually hired a full-time police chief. It was Melvin Graves, right? So, Melvin Graves um, established the police department. Um, he was actually the only police officer for about you know, close to 20 years. Um, so, he's not in this picture here. Um, th this picture here is was taken probably in the 20s. Um, it's one of the older photographs. This is definitely the Memorial Day photograph. It was taken on Memorial Day. So the, um, this is, not 20s, it was taken in the 30s, my dad. So this is Bill Engelman. He eventually became the chief of police. Um, Frank Hart eventually became the chief of police, right? Jack Trainer, who was the chief of police. And there's, there's a, a, lot of, a lot of discussion of who that is. Um, there's a lot of people back and forth who can't quite make certain who they think that is. I think that's Bud Jewett, oh, wow. Clarence Jewett. Yeah. And, I, and I, Mike Jewett, does anyone know Mike who lives here in town? Um, Mike is a retired professor from Amherst College and a friend of mine who would have been, a, did, he, he believes that that's who that is as well, that, that's Clarence Jewett. But, um, so in so the 1920s, there was about 6,000 people in town, right? Yeah, it, God bless you. I, I don't think I don't think that the population went over ten thousand until after the forties, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. Just question. So here are a couple of interesting facts about Melvin Graves that I thought were really really interesting. As we as I said, he was the sole officer for many years. Um, he was the one that he was the one that eventually oversaw the moving of the police station. So we're again we're talking about out front. About 1915 or so, um, there was some questions about what was going to happen to it, and then eventually, when the town hall was constructed, the courthouse was up on. There was a courthouse up on the second deck where the theater is up there, yeah. Yeah. or third deck, I'm sorry. And on Saturday mornings, a judge, a district court, would actually 
come, George would come and actually have district court on Saturday mornings um, in the upstairs there. And for a while, Chief Graves had a, had a little office there up on the third floor. And then, as we all know, eventually it ended up down in the basement where we... Mm -hmm. Prior to that, the police station was roughly in the area like where the firehouse is now. Yeah, yeah. So, so he was the one who kind of oversaw the, he was the movement. He eventually ended up hiring, and by the time he left, there were four full-time police officers. Um, one of whom was Ed O'Brien, um, was not pictured here, but Ed O'Brien, again, had the, uh, jumping ahead today, is a relationship to a couple people that whom I know, which is very interesting. Ed O'Brien actually was our first motorcycle officer. Oh. Um, and of course, Chief Graves oversaw the first purchasing of the police car, the first police car which we got in So we went a very long time without having motorcycle officers. But, so he became the police chief in 1894. Um, I mean, appointed as a police officer. They actually named him, or nom, nom, he was nominally named as the police chief about 1915, according to my records, and then he left the job in 1936. But for most of these early portions of his job, he was the only full-time police officer. He hired other men, and there, there are some names that float in there. I actually have lists of them. Um, but it appears as though they were people that were either hired as night watchmen or as part-time police officers or constables. Um, kind of interesting about that. The call boxes at the time, which I would, we have one of them, um, there's one in the police station, but the call boxes at the time, there is actually somewhere that I have never seen, and I don't think was, there is a map of where the call boxes were located. We know that the one that we have is not the one that was here in the center of town, which is the most famed one. The one we had was recovered the DBW um, back in back in the 70s and has, has been has been redone. Um, I think that's the one that I think that's the one that was up on, on North Pleasant Street by where the rotary is now and what is now Eastman Lane. So, but that's kind of an assumption on my part, I'm not sure. Um, Edward O'Brien, we talked about Thomas Dillon, the third officer they hired was a, an officer named Dwight Slate. There's not a lot written about him. In handwriting, the, the beginning stages of this one, this is what the rules and regulations look like for the police department when Melvin Graves handed over the uh, over the job to Jack Trainer. And Jack Trainer further codified this, and this is and actually the original of this are in my chief's office. They're mm -hmm. done on a typewriter on that old onion skin paper. They're, they're very, they've, they've actually been preserved because some of the uh, acid was starting, as you can see, like, mm -hmm. starting to kind of mess with the paper a little bit. But, if you're going to read these, and I have a copy of here, and anyone can, I, I made a photocopy of them. It basically talks about things that you ought to do. <laughs> um, just to kind of put this in perspective, our police now, um, I, we just redid our accreditation assessment and closure a couple of weeks ago. We have about 115 policies. <laughs> no, literally, we have 115 policies plus a whole manual of memoranda and operational special orders. Um, if, you need to, if you need to get a new tie, there's an order on that. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, we've learned from policing that, you know, that where cops get in trouble, and how they, you know, one of the things that happens when policing breaks down in the community is, is when we leave people to their own devices in an area that they don't do very often. So, so the concept behind that, that what we have now is, is that we, we have directions for, like, when you get into a cruiser accident, if you've never been in a cruiser action, like, what do you do? Yeah. And if they don't do it correctly, then we can take some type of disciplinary action or retrain or whatever it's called. For. So, but I just think it's funny that, you know, you got on the job and they gave you your revolver and your nightstick and said, hey, read this and get out there. <laughs> Good luck to you. Um, things are a, lot, a little different. So. Um, Jack Trainer became the, uh, the chief of police in 1926. Um, he was at relatively short for by Amherst standards. He was only chief of police for 23 years. <laughs> or a police officer for 23 years, I'm sorry. Um, he became the chief in 1936. And, um, he was actually a little older than the traditional police officer when he became a police officer. And that's one of the reasons. When he retired in 1949, he was at retirement age. Um, he had, had a prior life. Um, he was an educator early on. Um, he was actually a very well-read man, from what I understand. And clearly, I didn't know him. He passed away. But the trainer family still, anybody know any of the trainers? There are, there are some trainers that live in town. Do you know Phil Shepard? No? The name is familiar, but I can't think of where. His son, his son, also named John, also went by Jack, just passed away within the last seven or eight years, maybe ten years or so, um, lived in town. But there's some other. 
Um, a couple of things that, that uh, Chief Trainer did that were really interesting. Um, he was the first person, he was the first person or the first chief to really start an accurate record keeping. Um, he also was the one, he, he, be, he recognized that the Massachusetts State Police were a resource for us. Um, and so they, he began inviting them in here and we, they did joint train together, particularly right after World War II, right at the tail end of his, of his, of his chief. He recognized a lot of the returning vets that were being hired needed training that was outside the military. Um, he was the first one that required accurate crime scenes to be done at certain, um, long before CSI was invented. Um, I, I, I didn't realize, I didn't know how boring I would be, so I brought, I brought, I brought some things to look at, and I think this is kind of interesting, if it passes around that way you won't pay attention to because about 70% of what I've been doing today are lies. Um, <laughs> Kind of an interesting thing was is we didn't really have photography in the Amherst Police Department until the 50s. So if you had like a major accident or a fatality or something like that, we called the state police. So there was a corporal by the name of Soroy that lived on, on West Street, um, and he would come and take photographs for us. And so there's some interesting ones here. I'll pass these around. They're really kind of interesting to look at. Most of these are from the 30s. Um, Chief Trainer was the one who insisted on this, that like certain traffic accidents where injuries will occur, because statutorily they won't require it in those days. But he recognized the need for that. Um, and, and it, it really kind of, it sounds so silly that we had cops that were taking pictures of crime scenes, but in the 30s that just wasn't done. It just wasn't done. So, so I'm gonna, I'll hand a couple of these around. If you care to look at them, if not, just pass them on. But there's one, there's one in particular, and I have thousands of these, but there's one in particular that I'd like everyone to look at because this is a source of discussion in my group. This photograph here was taken in March of 1939 by Corporal Zoroy, Massachusetts State Police. And I'd like to know what intersection this is. Uh, um, uh, and I have, I have many, many different, I have my own opinion on this. Um, I don't know if anyone know Gabriel Tink, he's the other captain that I work with. So Gabe and I, we fight constantly. Um, and it, because he's not here, I'll say this, I don't care for him very much. Um, he and I actually have had many discussions about that. He's done a bunch of research on it, so I'd like to pass it around. But, but there's some other interesting things in here that I think are great. This is a very interesting photograph as well that would have been caused by a chief trainer, also taken by Corporal Soroy. And what's really cool, if, if, you, I, if you had a magnifying glass or like my, my fingerprint glass that I still keep on my desk, because it kind of makes me look very as a policeman a lot of time. You can see this. This is the. This is the. This is nine. This is nine and College Street, right? This is College Street in the South Pleasant Street intersection. Um, as you're looking, as you're looking northbound towards Hastings, and you can see the. You can see the Grace Church and, and the Common. The flags at half mast. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. Yeah. And then I look and see the date, and the date was December 11th, 1941. Oh, exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of an interesting photograph. So. Wow. And there are some others. If you care to look at them, great. If not, I just kind of kind of thought these. Interesting. Now I can, now I can, I can basically talk about nothing up here. Right. You guys don't know what's going on. If I give out candy, do I need to go? Well, it's 10 o'clock. So. You tell me when it's time. Well, if people have to leave at one, they'll leave at okay. one, and we'll, we'll just keep listening. Let's scoop because I'm almost done. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, no, that was All right, so Bill Engelman, uh, we won't talk a lot about Bill Engelman. He didn't really do much as the chief. He had been a long time patrolman. He was kind of, um, he was, quite frankly, without speaking ill of the dead, he was a chief that really didn't do a lot and kind of, the way he left the being being the police chief was not in the best thing. He was not the most up there. He ended up taking his own life way in life. So um, he, um, there was some indication that he might have been not the most up and up chief, and so he's the. Uh, he did do some things that were interesting during the fifties. I mean, he did integrate a lot of the veterans that were returning from World War II. Um, chief Engelman also also really raised the level of policing in terms of manpower. They went from being a five or six man police department up to like a fifteen or twenty man police department. But that's also a large part because the town was rolled so much in the forties in the time shortly following the second world war. So again, yeah, some of these well, photographs that we're passing around. Oh, that one, you should yeah. be able to read. There's a sign. Is that, is that the questionable one? No. No, that's not. No, this that's, is one of that. Yeah. You're saying, St. Bridges Church is yeah. there. The post office is right there. Yeah. The right. gas station is oh, right there. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, that's right. But before, if you actually look at this with a magnifying glass, what this is, is this is uh, 
It says that it's, you've got that picture. It's the Chevy dealership. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. ended up on Dickinson Street eventually before Ren was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. right. Yeah, I showed that to Jeff Roy. You remember Jeff? Yeah. He became the chief of police down. Jeff's like, I remember the Frosty Cap. I do too. Do you remember that was the Sunshine Car Wash at one point? Yeah, March uh, Bath. March Bath, Sunshine Car Wash. Yeah. 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 So Look Chief Hart, uh, that's right at the corner of is Southeast Street. Oh, I know Chief Hart. And Regina. Yeah. Yeah. And she yeah. 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 I actually just saw him there the other day. Yeah. So, um, so Frank, um, Frank uh, is a very important part of our agency. He was kind of a, and I didn't know him. He passed away shortly before I got here. Um, but he. A couple things with Frank. One, he, he came here as a college student, um, and that's how he ended up. He was originally from Whitman, Massachusetts. Uh, in fact, he was a semi-professional football player. He was a big guy like me, um, and he came out here to go to college. And he was in their their writings that we have that we've seen of his were back in the '60s. He's reporting the necessity for police officers to have to have an education beyond high school, and that in in that he recognized that for them truly to be able to serve the and, and where we are now is we, we, we won't hire somebody unless they have a college education. So you think of this where that's come in 50 years. Um, he, uh, he was a forward thinker. Um, even though he wasn't a polished man, from what I understand, he was, he was uh, one of these people that was truly looking to, you know, we talked earlier about like thinking strategically and planning strategically as an agency. He was the one who really instilled in a lot of what he did early on. Um, kind of has filtered down the way we think and the way we conduct business. He refused. He refused to hire police officers and put them on the street that he didn't train. So the very first police officer that ever went to a true academy was Don Maya, oh. who eventually became the chief. When, she, when Maya got hired in the late 50s, 58, 59, he went to the state police academy in, in the same state police academy that I went to um, in Framingham. Oh, I, I went to the one in Agua, but the same state police academy and. Um, he was the first in the line that, and that became a requirement of the job. Back when a lot of large agencies, like agencies like Springfield PD and Agua PD, weren't doing that. They would hire you, you were somebody's brother-in-law, they gave you your revolver and a nightstick and told you to go out there and do good. And then lo and behold, you find out these cops were robbing people and everyone wondered why. There were no backgrounds done, there, were no, there was no vetting process. He started a vetting process in the 60s about how he was going to vet police officers. You think about really how remarkable that is. Yeah. And we now, of course, we use background investigation tools that they didn't have available. Right. And so he presided over the big expansion of the university, or over the department during that period when they... <coughs> when it kind of went from being Mass Aggie to yeah, the university. Yeah, boomed in the 70s there. Yeah, I mean, in the 60s. My, my, guess, is that, my guess is you're right, because... Um, he, he actually also created a rank structure, which we, prior to that, there only was, there was a chief and a deputy, and then everyone else was a patrolman. Um, and then they created Weymouth Heath, Buck Heath, um, was our first sergeant, and then so after that, Chief Maya became a sergeant, and we hit, because of that boom in the size of the agency, um, he had to create different different ranks that were never a necessity. Before. Did he come as a student at the university, or? Yeah, he went to the agricultural school, um, and uh, that's how he ended up out there. He was a doctorate grad. Yes, the farm. Yeah, Brown Strong Street. And yeah. if, if you go out in front of our station, the stock, what do you think? That's not a mystery. Look, not come on, come on, be on my side. <laughs> it's it's uh, Pleasant Street looking south uh, toward uh, the crossing of uh, Amity. And That's what Gabe thinks, too. And I'll yeah. point out again that yeah. I don't care yeah. about him. <laughs> yeah. Present fire station. Uh, uh, this building that Barry Roberts owns it was moved that way in order to uh, uh, expand the store, which is now uh, CBS. Oh, the, oh, the house that was moved where Dick Vincent Yeah, well, when I, was a, when I was a young cop here, that was a grocery store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah. The best story about Frank Hart. Ah, here we go. You'll remember this, Phil. Maybe I don't think you were in town when I was. Uh, in the when there were police, there were student riots going on. When there were that? problems in the late sixties, early seventies, oh. Vietnam uprising, all of that. And that Frank Hart. Era. We didn't, we didn't Frank lie. Hart was the was the chief, <laughs> and he was a farmer as well. 
and he used to come and stand in his farmer overalls in the center of town, right at the, the main intersection. Uh, and the, the and he talked to the students, and he'd say, you know, what what are you doing? You know, I mean, guys, this isn't the way to bring about change. You got to go do and take things, you know, as they come and move it along. And the students were like, God, what is this? This guy's the police chief. He doesn't look like a police chief, and he just managed to keep everything very calm. And Amherst was one of the few towns that didn't really have any problems during all of that. And it I think he had very, a lot to do it with it. It was a very active town. Remember Eric the Red? Oh, yeah. Eric the Red. And there was a the lot, red. you're right, there was a lot of uh, protests. You're absolutely yeah. right. And with the uh, student here, yeah. And they also had streaking in the 70s, too, yep. oh, which I was yes. never at the right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> I have photographs, so I'll show you later. So <laughs> Well, it's funny you say that because I remember when I was a young cop. So I would this would have been I'd been on the job maybe ten years when the when when the first Gulf War. So we're talking the early nineties, twenty five years ago. And Don Maya was the chief, and there were some protests, and some people took over an intersection down in the center of town, and they were protesting. And, and Chief Maya said, I, I remember saying to him, I said, you know, what are we going to do? And he said, we're going to direct traffic around. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, and back in those days, I was fit. I had all my hair, and I was all polished up. And he go, I go, what do you mean? He goes, we're going to drive traffic around. But think of how, how much common sense that is. Like, why pick a fight you don't need to pick? You know, and a lot of that came from, from heart. That, that common sense approach, a way to understand that just, you know, protesting is part of what makes us us. And that's okay. And that's okay. And so, you know, that's, it's funny, we have all these tools and these things talking about community policing, but if you actually realize that you truly are part of the community, it makes community policing just something you do and not a program, right? So that's the way I look at it, and that's the way I was told to look at it. Back in those days, they had to beat it into my head. Um, because I know people have to. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, that's a great thing. This is, that's kind of neat. Um, Wait, get some more? There he is. Okay. So Chief Maya, of course, he took over, he hired me. Yeah. One of the things, that one of the games that we used to play in the station was who was the last person that was hired by which chief. Oh. So, so Ed Motlingon was the last officer that Frank Hart hired. He was badge 18, I'm badge 49. Um, you were right behind me. Yeah, that's right, yeah, your neighbor, yeah, sure. Um, Don Maya, the last person that hired, that he hired was a, was Mike Barone, who we saw earlier in the photograph, so. Um, be, the last person that Chief that Chief Sherpa hired was Marcus Humber. I don't know if you know Marcus well. It's just it's it's kind of been, I'm not I'm like right I'm like the middle child, <laughs> and I'm left-handed, so I'm like all messed up. So, um, so Chief Maya was a, it was a veteran, and that that actually makes a lot. Of, he was an Air Force veteran, and um, a lot of the things that he did in the '70s he, when he became the chief in, in uh, 1973 was he really was the one who very much refined the way we kept records. And we still, he, he used to say that to you when you were young cop, you're a department of record. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. If you don't record it, it didn't happen. So he actually devised a system when he was a sergeant. It's an old, it's still in the station today. These old card system where the, we used an old Selectric's typewriter, and I did it as a young cop too. If you arrested somebody or wrote them a citation or placed them in a protective custody or assisted them, you did a report on a little colored index card. Pink was for arrest, blue was for a citation, oh, yeah. yellow was for a protective custody, and they were filed in this enormous filing cabinet, and it was the first like Rolodex way to go back and search people. So as an investigator, when you were doing it, somebody found out somebody broke into somebody's garage, well, you knew that somebody had been in a car with somebody, you could go and pull these cards out, and it was a wealth of it. It's outdated now, because we, we, we went computer. Right under Chief Maya's leadership in 1988. Oh. Our first computer system was installed. So, um, but it was, it's, it's interesting, it's still upstairs. We keep it up in the records, it's filled with thousands, of, and once in a while, I'll pull out, and, you know, somebody who I arrested back in the 80s when I had all my hair in a flat stomach, and I, and I look at it, I say, oh, it's, you know, kind of interesting that that piece, of, and there are, there are cards in there that go back to when he was a sergeant in the early 60s. It's very, very fascinating. So, of course, he retired in 2000. Um, Don's still alive. Um, he still resides here in town. He's a life, lifelong resident. He uh, 
he lives up in North Amherst, and I, I saw him uh, right on Christmas time. So it's, it's, it's a common thing when you get promoted that you call the former chiefs. And, you know, we had some promotions recently, and I call the chief up because he likes to keep track of what's going on at the station. I don't see him very often anymore. And so then, of course, Charlie Sherpa became the chief of police. He was the next one. Um, chief Sherpa was actually not an, originally an Amherst kid. He's like me, a Springfield kid. Um, he was a Long Meadow police officer for a couple years before he came here to Amherst. Um, it's ironic because one of the reasons I think I work here is because of Chief Sherpa. My father-in-law is a, an Italian guy from South End in Springfield where Chief Sherpa is, and they knew one another. And I think that when I put in my application that maybe, just maybe, he recognized the name because I wrote it like 80 times on the application. <laughs> um, so that may or may not have something to do with why I work here. But um, Chief Sherp was a great guy. and He, he really also was a builder. Um, this is, he is the one who oversaw accreditation. He's one of the people that installed, install, we have a very firm and very often copied field training program that a portion is stolen, a portion we refine. Um, he is the one who created a, a, a mentoring program within our agency, which has become really oh. instrumental in how we do things. Um, he is the first one to oversee true change as it relates to community relations. He, he recognized that outreach was important, and he's the one who began it, and Chief Livingstone has helped further that. Um, and Chief Sherpa actually, again, by Amherst standards, has known the Chief of Police for about a decade, very short. Yeah, for many, many years. Um, and of course, Chief Sherpa still was here in town. He raised his family here. His daughter's a school teacher um, and an educator. So, Courtney, yes, yeah, Courtney. And she, and she actually has a family of her own. Now she lives nearby. And, and of course, we we know Chief Livingstone is currently the president. Chief, he like me was a, a community service officer. He was the first chief to be a community service officer. He a little earlier than I. Um, kind of an interesting document if anyone was ever bored and wanted to look at it. I keep track of the. Uh, of the old Z numbers that we used to use as CSOs, that was Z79 <laughs> in your program and in your hearts. In your hearts. <laughs> the chief was uh, Z, where was he? The current chief was Z19. Wow. So there were wow. 70 CSOs between the chief and I, and I point that out to wow. him frequently. Um, just the way that went, so kind of interesting. But he's, he's been a great chief. Um, he's a forward thinker. There are a couple things that I really like about our current chief. There are a lot of things I like about our current chief, but there's two things that I like about him. One is, is he is he is a big proponent and recognizes that the agency is bigger than he is, and that that he and I are in the deep autumn of our careers, and um, that we need to wrap our head around the future and what's going to be best for the agency and the community, and not for what's best for he and I. The other thing I like about our chief is he's very thoughtful. He doesn't make decisions rationally. Um, and he understands that some of the decisions that he makes impacts not just the agency but the community. He's a, he's a good thinker and, um, and an all-around decent guy, so um, that's that. So just kind of wrap up, I bring this back up because a lot of this a lot of this comes back to Chief Hart. If Chief Maya were here, he would tell you that you know it takes a forward thinker to kind of create something and we kind of do a lot of things that this man was thinking about 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Which I think closer to 80 now, because he became a police officer in the 30s. Mm -hmm. So um, pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, yeah, pretty interesting. So that's that. Um, I'm sorry I went on beyond my time. That's all right. Thank you for having me. Oh, one time, you forgot to mention that the Amherst Police Department is the birthplace of like 15 police chiefs. Over the decades. I think you're absolutely right on the money, and, and uh, Chief Sherpa keeps telling me that the office that I'm in yes. is the lucky office, and I'm supposed to move, but I, and I keep telling him I'm too old for that. Because um, Chris Provost went to Belchertown, yeah. Jen went to South Hadley, yeah. Jeff went to someplace else. Yep, he went to Orleans Mass. And Mike Kent went there. Yep, yep. The recent ones, but then you go back. Oh, sure, John O'Connor, and yeah, yeah they went, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is, I mean, a, a large, we're fortunate because the town treats us well. Yeah. Like our, our training budget, and I shouldn't say this with, amongst taxpayers, but I will, because it's, it's actually kind of a, our training budget is triple what some other agencies are around here. Yeah. It does pay off. I mean, we make mistakes, but our mistakes are mitigated, and it's not an accident, you know, it really isn't. So 
But the byproduct is that there have been a lot of people that have brought that and been able to go to other agencies because right. of what they've learned And here. then they will transfer it to those, so you're improving all the police departments all over. Right. I guess I hadn't thought of that, Phyllis, yeah. but you're yeah. onto something there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just was looking out for their own selfish reasons that they were able to further their careers mm -hmm. um, because of things that the town gave us. Mm -hmm. um, and we're aware of it. Like, it's not something we take for granted. We know that we have something that most other agencies don't. Could you speak a little bit about the relationship of the Amherst Police Department to the county lockup and you know, the one the guard used to oh, sure. manage. Is that been a long-standing thing? Is that like it's uh, probably been? It's it's it, it's a relatively recent thing. Yeah. So, um, and I'm going to say maybe within the last ten years, and, and that's really truly evolved. There's an MOU that it, it exists. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, yeah. <laughs> is when we take somebody into custody, right? So there, there are very specific laws about how we keep people in custody and when we have to release them. And there was some case law that popped up in like the early two part of 2000 about somebody. It goes back to the old due process. <coughs> here. You take somebody, you take somebody in custody on let's say a Friday night, and the the bail commissioner would say hold them till Monday because they had a history of defaults or the, the severity of the crime or something along those lines. But they, there was no due process. In other words, there was no review of the complaint in that 72-hour period. Or like, if it was a Monday, like we sometimes we'd have somebody in our own cell block. If it was Labor Day weekend, they'd be there till Tuesday morning, right? So you have this person that's in custody, but there's no independent review. There's no statutory. There's no, more important. There's no judicial review of the charges. It's just based on my probable cause statement, what I saw at the scene. So because of that case law, we recognize not just our department, all of it, we had to make a better plan about how, because that was not uncommon when I was a young officer, we'd arrest somebody for a crime. Something, let's say if something's severe, or they had history, we'd have to feed them and clothe them, and, for, and we were not prepared or trained to do that. So when, when the regional lockout came up, that came originally, and I might be lying a little bit now, I think originally it came from monies from the federal government, and then eventually was funded by the state, for that purpose, so that police departments that had to keep somebody in custody. So in other words, somebody shot and killed somebody, we made an arrest on a, on a Saturday morning. We'd have a place to bring them, a place where people were trained for, you know, better trained in like suicide liabilities. Mm -hmm. They had a medical plan in place. Um, they were just better prepared for monitoring people who were custody than the average patrolman in, in any town USA. Mm -hmm. that, that was the original reason they went for it. We rarely keep someone in our cell block mm -hmm. for very long. It's truly a temporary holding facility. If we arrest somebody, they're either brought to regional lockup or they're brought directly to court. Mm -hmm. it, it's very, very anomalous for somebody to stay for any period of time in our, in, in our custody. We, we, and, and the other thing too is we don't arrest people like we used to. You know, if you went back, if you went back even 10 years ago, we would make something like 2,500 or 3,000 arrests a year. Mm -hmm. And we probably make 60% of that now. We arrest for the most serious crimes or the mandated arrest, but some of the more the nuisance-related crimes that we have, we tend not to make physical arrests for anymore. Mm -hmm. And because we've we found that by extending outreach and, and going back with them, um, or sometimes if we bring them to court in, in a summons fashion, that there can be an alternative sentence that makes the victim whole, but improves our relationship at the community level, or so something like a vandalism or something like oh, that. Yeah. Um, so, and I know there are a lot of people who are saying, oh, well, you don't arrest as many people. It doesn't mean we don't solve the crime, it's just we don't physically take as many people into custody as we once we did. So. What about the relationship with the uh, police forces and the colleges? Because that's a unique uh, thing that we have here in Amherst that they don't have in a lot of other communities. It sure is, you know, and it's like, for me, it's, it's kind of like always the way it's always been, right? So, yeah. but you talk to other friends, where I talk to people, you know, someone like Chris Pronovos who left and went to Belchertown, and it's a different environment. Our relate, so let's take the university police, for instance. It's the obvious one because they're such a big agency. They're very well trained. Mm -hmm. There's great people up there. Um, it's, it's, they have a different mission than we have. Um, and so sometimes we have to negotiate that. It's not right or wrong, it just is. Yeah. So we've, I think we in the last 15 years or so, Chief, Chief Livingstone has a large lot to do with this. We've negotiated that and we figured that out that it, that we can both kind of do what's best for our respective communities and then kind of work in harmony and concert to it. And it's and we've also done well too because Amherst College is 
led by a police chief who is a forward thinker now, and the training level that he has there is excellent. So, you know, you see an Amherst College police officer, you're actually getting a quality trained person instead of a night watchman. Kind of thing. So, um, one of the things I want to talk about too, and I mentioned, I forgot to mention this with Chief Sheriff, but when I came on, when I got here on the, on the job in the early 80s, there was one female officer. Mm -hmm. It was one, one female officer, and now, now our, I think we're like, I think like 23% of our police force is okay. women, 21%, something like that. Okay. So, um, yeah, basically it was a bunch of white guys running around in uniforms and leave. <laughs> you know, Chief Livingston and Chief Sherpa recognized that, you know, that just isn't going to work. So he, uh, you know, he recognized that the, you know, the community's got to kind of look more like the community. So mm -hmm. the police department, and so the way he started recruiting processes um, is so much different. Back in the olden days, people got hired because of who they knew and how things went. Mm -hmm. Our recruiting process now is, um, it, it's, I think it would rival most other agencies. So, am I eating up time here? Do you need me to get me out of here? Okay. This is great. Thank oh, you, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.